I got an ARC, folks, an advanced reader copy. This is the first one I've ever gotten. So that's going to be included in this wrap-up. Read seven new books and had two rereads, although one of the rereads is only kind of a book. It's arguably just the first volume and a part of one larger book. Whatever. Let's get into it. Okay, so as per the new format that I asked if you guys preferred and then only one contemptible emu said yes, but no one said no and then I forgot about it. But I'm remembering this time and we are going to start with rereads. And I've reread two books. Uh, the first of which was The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. And I'm actually, I'm in Return of the King now. I was reading this somewhat slowly throughout basically the entire month. I was never reading it as my main thing. I was just kind of doing like a chapter or sometimes a couple chapters in a day. This, I think, is an excellent example of how going into a book with the right expectations and the right expectations of what the author can do can just vastly change the reading experience. Because I have read uh, Lord of the Rings before. I read it in early 2021. And I liked it, but I didn't love it, but I am loving it this time. I'm definitely going to make a video when I'm done about how different the reading experience and why I think that was. And I think uh, this does, I think to me, show that like one reason why reviewing books can be useful in that if you have expectations of what the author is going for and what type of story it is, it can make you enjoy it so much more than if you go in with your head trying to think that it's something it isn't because then you think oh it's just doing what it's not trying to do but what you think it's trying to do poorly anyways i'm not going to give a score for fellowship because i'm treating it as one book but uh lord of the rings in general is probably going to be like a low nine point something for me it's not going to be like a literal all-time favorite but it's going to be among my favorite standalones i'm so happy i'm enjoying it this is one of the books that the first time i read it i've never wanted to enjoy a book or series more but I just didn't end up, well, I did enjoy it, but uh, they were all like three or four stars and in like the sevens, and I'm enjoying it so much more now. Anyways, the other book I reread, which was the book we did for a university book club, was The Emperor's Soul by Brandon Sanderson. And I, I read this in a sitting again, and I think it it's like literally as good as anything Sanderson has written. It is... It is a book that is hard to do justice. For Goodreads, I did I did give on Goodreads. I did say I gave it ten out of ten. I, I'm like okay, I may have been over. It's like, but I give this like literally a nine point nine out of ten. It's one of like my five favorite books of all time. Uh, this is just, it's amazing what this does in like a hundred and ten pages. It's just such a beautiful story. It's paced perfectly, like, the, there's multiple amazing character arcs. You get the impression that there's a world outside of this. Like, this book takes, 90% of it takes place in a room, and yet it's just, it's so good. It's literally, like, it's in contention for my favorite thing Sanderson has written, and Sanderson's my second favorite author, and I'm so glad this won the Hugo, because nothing else he writes is going to win the Hugo. They're not going to give Stormlight 5 the Hugo, um... But this deserved the Hugo more than anything else he's written in, so uh, what got it deserved it. Um, I love this so much. Okay, that's rereads out of the way. And uh, we now have seven books I read for the first time. We have two that I gave five stars on Goodreads. We got four four star no, three four stars, a three star, and a DNF. So we are going to go from least favorite to favorite, and... The DNF is Shorefall uh, by Robert Jackson Bennett. This is the uh, sequel to Foundryside by Robert Jackson Bennett. And basically, uh, Foundryside had a couple things in its favor. It had a really, really cool magic system. And it had a plot that kept me engaged. I wasn't super invested in like the characters. Uh, the writing was almost like even more Sanderson-esque than what you'd expect from Sanderson, and it just, like, the emotional moments didn't land for me, but it never got in the way. This still had the cool magic system, but that's basically all I thought it had in its favor. The plot did not have me engaged, 
So it was just like, I was just reading it for the cool bits of magic, which just whatever. And it also introduced a new character who's like Robert Jackson Bennett's attempt at like a really old, like multi-thousand-year-old character. And oh, I hated that character so much. I'm somewhat picky when it comes to really old characters. And this is maybe like one of my least favorites ever. It really felt like it was this thousand year old was so childish he had like this saying that he keeps saying and it wasn't even true he's just like the problem with might is there's always something someone mightier and i'm like is that the case though like someone go tell genghis khan that i'm pretty sure he was the mightiest person like are you saying that this sounds like it's general advice but it only applies because you exist like do you actually think someone's mightier than you i don't even think you believe this and he just that like that care i was uh, cringing every time he was in a scene and he played a really important role in this book so i'm not going to give this a score because i only read about half of it but it would be under five it it, like i didn't hate it because the magic system was actually really cool cool like scrivening i just didn't care what was going to happen so i didn't feel like reading it and i wanted to read the book that was next on my tbr so i just stopped Uh, I would like to point out that this book is totally fine, as is Gideon the Ninth, and yet there's another book that I'm going to talk about later that somehow has, like, a bend in it. I don't even know how. I never dropped it or anything, and I was always careful with it. Why does this only happen with books? Why are only books I don't like indestructible? Anyways, moving on, we have the three-star book, which was uh, slightly disappointing. I liked this book. This was, it'd be like three and a half. Uh, was The Fall of Hyperion by Dan Simmons. This was one where I think it's a really good execution of what it's trying to do. I just wasn't that interested. It felt like all the characters I was least interested in in the first Hyperion are the ones who got the most screen time here. And it also introduced a new character. I continue to be like, wow, Dan Simmons, you really like John Keats. Find someone who likes you as much as Dan Simmons likes John Keats and you'll be doing well. Uh, it focused a lot more on the cyberpunk aspect and uh, kind of like I think the detective's tale is like the most important for this one and that was my least favorite of the stories. I'm not a huge fan of the cyberpunk stuff so it kind of makes sense I didn't like this as much. It introduced a new character who was cool that was CEO Gladstone. I liked her. This basically this had a lot of stuff I really liked. Uh, some of the, like the character stuff with the people who, like, we met and the people who had the tales in Hyperion, especially the stuff with, like, Soul and the Poet, was was excellent. But it also had a lot that I was just not interested in. So I liked this book. I by no means dislike this book. Like, I wasn't close to disliking this book. This isn't going to be on any, like, bottom list. I just liked Hyperion a lot more. Uh, this was kind of a lot more focused on world building, cyberpunk, and a weird amount of focus on John Keats and there was just some strange decisions coming down the stretch I kind of gone because there was near the end there was something that I thought was really good then right after there was a couple things I was kind of like okay um and one thing really going in this novel's favor though is that the Shrike and the Tree of Thorns is one of the most like horrifying sci-fi fantasy things ever to be put put in a book oh my so, I like Fall of Hyperion, I just didn't love Fall of Hyperion. And then, we move on to uh, the final book in this Black Company omnibus, which is book three in the nine book series of the Chronicles of the Black Company, which was The White Rose by Glenn Cook. And this, once again, was a book I really enjoyed. I enjoyed it about as much as book one, The Black Company, Shadows Linger, was pretty comfortably my favorite of the three. This one, the I thought the Croker stuff, who's the protagonist of the series was as strong as it's been for any of the books probably actually my favorite croaker book but i thought like this also had other stories this actually had three povs and he did do something very clever with the povs um and like the different perspectives that was really clever but i just didn't enjoy the other perspectives nearly as much as i did croaker i'm wondering if i would feel different on a reread now that i'm kind of more aware of what's going on Uh, But it continues to not be nearly as military fantasy and very different from The Black Company, which was more like almost a collection of novellas. This is a more folk, like an actual more focused narrative. Um, 
and has a lot more like intrigue and world building stuff than like actual like military battles and it does focus less on the military battles uh intro really delved into some of the characters that i wasn't really expecting to get delved into so i am looking forward to continuing the black company i forgot to give a score for fall of hyperion i give fall hyperion like a 6.8 out of 10 and this would be an 8.1 out of 10 i really did enjoy the white rose and have continued to enjoy uh every book in the black company so far i know it's a divisive series in that a lot of people don't seem to enjoy it and i don't fully understand why but i guess i don't need to understand uh Anyways, yeah, really enjoyed this. And next up, my we're getting the top four for the month, not including rereads, is Arm of the Sphinx by Josiah Bancroft. This one, character-wise, was a lot wider than Senlin Ascends. Senlin Ascends was kind of hyper-focused on Senlin, while this definitely is almost an omniscient. It's like POV hopping pretty rapidly. I don't have a huge amount to say about this. It's kind of in the same boat as Senlin Ascends. I basically have no criticisms for it. I think it's basically good in every way. It hasn't blown me away. The setting continues to be, I think, its biggest pro. The Tower of Babel is like a wonderfully creative setting, and it has set up like for like a really interesting story with the Hod King. Uh, it has a really interesting cast of characters who are all compelling. Had some weird stuff at the end that made me go, "What the hell?" Um, yeah, it was really good. I'm st it's still not like an all-time favorite I'm waiting for that to happen but there's like almost nothing I have that I could say like he did wrong or I think could be improved it was just I don't know I guess the style of characters don't have me ultra emotionally invested I don't know why but I'd give it like an 8.3 out of 10 it was excellent it kept me engaged throughout all the characters are really distinctive the setting is awesome uh it's exploration of theme is really good it's, it's good across the board yeah Arm of the Sphinx. Sendlin's a good series, people. And topping out the Arm of the Sphinx, I think also with a score of 8.3 out of 10, which I might bump up, is The Dragon Bone Chair by Tad Williams, the first book in a memory, sorrow, and thorn. The four the four book trilogy, because the Green Angel Tower is 520,000 words long. This was awesome. Uh, this is more classic fantasy. This is kind of feels to me like stylistically it's more Hob like esque. I think Hob fans would probably in enjoy this quite a bit, and vice versa. I think if you're a huge Memory and Sword and Thorn fan, you should probably go read Farseer, uh, and then Live Ship, and then Tawny Man, and then Rain Wilds, and then Fits in the Fool. Just saying, publication order. Uh, but I. Yeah, this is kind of, in terms of, like, ideas and content, it feels a bit like the stepping stone between Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire, where in it's more A Song of Ice and Fire-like than Lord of the Rings in almost every way, and it's more Lord of the Rings-like than A Song of Ice and Fire in almost every way, where it's got, like, the classic fantasy vibes with, like, the elves and the stuff like that. It has kind of a mix of the kind of, like, Tolkien dialogue you'd expect that's very, like, kind of wise and sometimes almost poetic. Um, and, you know, the way, like, people tell stories and recount stories for Tolkien and them mixed up with, like, the George R. R. Martin Abercrombie's dialogue, which is, like, what you would expect to actually hear people, like, talking to each other if you just went and, like, were weird and eavesdropped on people or something. I don't know. Um... Obviously, people uh, love Tad for his prose. His prose, I thought, yeah, was pretty excellent. It wouldn't quite be in my S tier. I thought it stood out the most in, like, atmospheric scenes and, like, dream sequences and dialogue. Um, yeah, it was really good. And the ending, I was not expecting the ending to be as crazy as it was. This had an insane ending. This had, I guess, like a Tad Williams Lanch, a Williams NATO, a Tad NATO. I don't know. There's probably a name with it that incorporates some kind of natural disaster with the name Tad Williams, the same way Sander Lanch does, but it has that. So, great book. Uh, I'll be reading Stone of Farewell very soon. And my favorite book of the month that is actually available to read for the rest of you was A Song for Erebone by Mr. Guy Gavril K, which I do have a review for that I will likely make the end card for this video, if you are curious. This was my third Guy Gavril K historical-based book. He kind of has Fionavar, which is more like Tolkien-esque classic fantasy, and then the majority of his work, all the colored rainbow books, 
and this one are historical based and this of the first three i've now read four because i've read sailing to serantium by the time i've recorded this this is my third favorite of the historical ones but i also read it and right away was reminded like okay yeah this is quite a bit better than fionavar in my opinion uh, this is, I think, the most focused and tight Guy Gavriel K book. It did not quite have the emotional highs. The the previous two, like, and really all the Guy Gavriel K books, I've thought have had, like, amazing starts and then had something weird and wasn't as good, but I still liked in the middle and then ridiculously amazing endings. This was pretty steady, like, steadily improving quality throughout, and I think the middle part may even actually be my favorite, which is not something I like in general for Guy Gavriel K. That's not the case from what I have seen. But this was also a lot more focused on one protagonist, where unlike the others, where there's kind of few, very wide focus on characters, I think Blaze, I think that's his name. Um, I think that's how you pronounce that, whatever. Uh, he, I think, has POVs in almost every chapter, or at least it plays a role in basically every chapter of this book. And then... There is no clear, like, second most important character. Then other than about half this book would be my guess. I don't have a statistical analysis. I don't know if those can be found anywhere. But if I were to guess the POV distribution, Blaze would be about half the book. And then the other 50% would be roughly evenly split among, like, 7 to 10 people. And, yeah, it's Guy Gavriel K. I loved it. The way it was plotted, the setting, the pros and the characters and the themes I thought were all really, really good. He's becoming one of my favorite authors. But that was not my favorite book of the month because I'm happy to say my favorite book of the month, not including rereads, is Kingdoms of Death by Christopher Rocchio. So this was this is book four of The Sun Eater, which comes out March 22nd. I was lucky enough and was privileged enough to get an advanced reader copy from Da Books, who have been pretty stingy with the arcs, so I really appreciate that, because I was waiting for this book, and it did deliver. On one hand, I think it, it's gonna be, I think, a different reception from Demon and White, or that I think is probably going to average out to a similar level of enjoyment. There are, uh, there are basically any like first-person retrospective story, which for those of you who don't know, Sun Eater, the narrator, is like an 800-year-old telling his entire story. Um, and first-person retrospectives, I think, have the danger where the current narrator like hints at like really crazy and like life-altering things happen, and then you get to the life-altering thing, and you're like, okay, that was cool, but like it sounded cooler when I didn't know exactly what it was. This does not happen in Kingdoms of Death. I have compared Demon in White to A Storm of Swords because A Storm of Swords basically has like two main things going in its favor. Thing one is like everything that happens is really interesting, a ridiculous amount of stuff happens, and it's just all good throughout, and that's Demon in White. Uh, Kingdoms of Death is the other aspect of Storm of Swords, where it has some of the ballsiest, like, and shocking moments that you see in a book that just make you, like, stare at a wall and go, like, holy crap for, like, hours after you read it. So, uh, Kingdoms of Death, I will say, I think might be, have one of the weakest settings for a section, and I enjoyed the first 20% a lot just because Hadrian is one of my favorite characters. I think the plot of the first 20% is not as strong as like the plot of the first 20% of Demon in White. And uh, don't expect it to be. Although, you know, people may disagree with me. I haven't really seen other people's opinion on this book. So I have no idea what the consensus is going to be. My guess is there are going to be people who think I'm drunk for having it not as my favorite Sun Eater book. And drunk for having it as my second favorite Sun Eater book. You'll see why. Um, and then going into the end, I liked it about as much as Howling Dark, but then, you know, Howling Dark has a pretty insane ending, but the ending to Kingdoms of Death, like the last third, both the climax and the falling action, are both among my favorites of any book ever. They were insane. I, I cannot wait to see other people react to what happened in this book. Like, holy crap. I literally, like, I was at work the next day. And I'm just, like, at work, like, these people around me don't know what I read last night. I want to talk to people about it. <sighs> if anyone wants to do a Kingdom of Death spoiler talk, obviously you can't know yet, because haven't read it. Let me know, because I think that'll be fun. Oh, man, I'm so looking forward to seeing other people read this. 
So I gave it a 9.4. Song for Our Bone was 9.3. Um, <sighs> Kingdoms of Death. Man. Man, Rocky. Rocky, you went, you went hard. So yeah, that was my reading. A pretty damn good reading, Marth. Had a random DNF in there, but other than that, quality was pretty damn high. Uh, only two books under four stars. I got an arc. I read some Guy Gavril K. Started some series. Reread some things. If I count Hyperion as a duology, I wrapped up a duology, which makes it my favorite duology ever because it's the only duology I've read. That is going to change almost certainly after I read Lord of Emperors and have read another duology that I'll like more probably. But that is all I got. That is what I read in the month of January. For the most part, a very successful month. I'm looking forward to seeing what you all think on March 22nd, and I can't wait to be... I'm going to be impatient. I'm going to be like, people, hurry up and read it faster. Get to the last 10 chapters. I want to see your reactions. Man, that was... Ha, 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 ha.